previously on the White Sox Talk podcast, brought to you by Wintrust. In fact, yesterday on the podcast. Believe it or not, there is a White Sox reliever who uh, I was told had uh, there was a lot of interest in him. There was one playoff team that really, really wanted him at the deadline. And I would not be shocked if he has moved. And when he is traded, assuming he is, it's going to shock White Sox fans. Aaron Bummer is going to be in high demand. Believe it or not, you're going to look at his ERA, which was, I believe, Infinity. No, I'm joking. Oh, you're clapping. You're clapping. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, his ERA was six or seven. Um, I think with better catching, Aaron Bummer will be a better pitcher. Just say that. Um, and his ground ball rate is really, really good. I think it's easy for us as fans to look at the results and go what is going on there in bummer he's awful but when you've got playoff teams banging on the door for aaron bummer just like you had the tampa bay rays saying give me jake deekman like the day after the white Sox let him go and everyone wanted him out of town there is much more than meets the eye with some of these funky pitchers like deekman and bummer so i could see bummer getting dealt in the Sox could get a lot, believe it or not, for him. Yeah, sure enough. Late Thursday night, Chris Getz made his first trade as White Sox GM, and it was a doozy sending Aaron Bummer to the Braves for not two players, not three, not even four. Five players, five of them. So who are the White Sox getting in these five players? Why did the Braves want Aaron Bummer so badly? We have a lot to discuss. Plus... Is it only a matter of when Aloy Jimenez gets traded and not if? Ryan McGuffey is with me to talk about the Aaron Bummer blockbuster trade. An Aaron Bummer blockbuster trade? Is it one? What the heck just happened? That and more. Next. Ryan McGuffey. We are here. Now look at you. You are well, they're double fist pumps. You are so psyched. Did the White Sox just win the World Series in the offseason? What happened here? Well, they didn't. But give Chris Getz a lot of credit. His first trade, no matter what happens with the result on the White Sox end, is a flipping success. What a deal. Seriously, what a deal. Claire, our beautiful, talented producer of this podcast that we referenced so many times. Was and the editor. One who, uh, I, I, when you're the producer, to me, like you're kind of – You do all things. Okay. You do, okay. You're, you're all things. Okay. But that's how I got tipped off on it. I don't know if that's how you got tipped off on it, but it was a text because of the podcast we had done 24 hours prior where I was showing Aaron Bummer stink face. And we were talking about, I was cheering why it's time to let him go. I never expect, like I literally thought a high end minor leaguer and look, there's a lot to sort through here in terms of who they're getting, but that's a, that's a big return. For for Aaron Bummer, a guy who struggled the last few years, I know analytically and metric wise, it's he's good, but wow. Well, I had heard to reference what I said on the previous podcast. I had heard that it was yes, the Braves to put together a big package for Aaron Bummer at the deadline, and the previous regime said no, they didn't make the deal. They did not make the deal, and Chris Getz takes over. He's like, ah, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll make yeah. this trade. I'll yes. make this trade. <laughs> so. What was I doing? What was I doing when this trade went down? It was announced. Chuck Garfine, as I speak about myself in the third person, was sleeping. I was sound asleep and I woke up to this. And I did want to know what other people were doing when they found out. Now, other people were obviously when they woke up and they found out. So I went to Twitter, Ryan, and I wow. asked Sox fans what they were doing, where they were when they found out that Chris Getz traded Aaron Bummer to the Braves for five players. You want to hear some of these responses? Oh, yeah. All right. We got Mike Lund who said, five guys for Aaron Bummer? Chris Getz may work out after all. <laughs> we got Adam Kunos. I found out this morning and had a triple check to see if this was real. All I can say is, wow. Fran E chimes in with, I thought it was a fever dream. Bill adds, I was riding unicorns with my friends, Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. No way this is true. I want to hang out with Bill more. Yeah, that's that's a good life to live. Uh, there is JR Ram 630. I was having airport beers. The the best, the most underrated beer in America. 
Yeah. Scully O. I was laying in bed scrolling the timeline when I told my husband and he insisted I fell for a parody account. Jack says, mark my words, Bummer will be a stud in Atlanta. Yeah, I agree with that. And finally, Lukey 2.0 chimes in with, I was listening to the end of the recent White Sox podcast when you were talking about Bummer being traded. That's awesome. That might be the best one. So he was actually <laughs> listening to me saying he's going to get traded and then he gets traded. <laughs> Um, I do agree with some, I, I, I do think you might be a stud in Atlanta. I don't give a shit. It don't matter. Yeah. We talked about this on the podcast. Like it, he probably will go to another a, a team that needs him to the team that's trying to win the world series and be perfectly placed in the role he's supposed to be in. Now he may come in and, and with inherited runners and go two Oh, and let them let, let Kelly crawl and company be mad about him. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Kroll, our former colleague, our good friend, who's a silent reporter. This is a, this is a, you know, I, I, we, we just wrapped up a, a zoom with Chris Getz and, you know, rarely would I ask a GM this, but like, as I was sitting there listening, I'm like, man, like the, my first thought, first of all, I'm with the, whoever said that I, they thought it was a parody account and like he had the husband, she kind of gave the husband a nod. I, I, I thought the same thing. I actually thought, hang on, is Claire getting duped by a fake Bob Nightingale here? I'm so excited. I'm hitting my damn computer so much. Um, and so then I know, I, of course, I did a deep, like I looked at it and I saw the Braves tweeted it and I was like, okay. And like, this is real. Yeah. And so like my, my the first phrase that jumped into my head was no brainer. The first phrase. And as I slept on it and woke up today, I was like, still a no brainer. And then as we were sitting there with Getz, I'm like, I got to ask him. Like, it seems like it, very... You wouldn't use that phrase all the time. And this is, again, I said on the, it's with all due respect to Aaron Bummer, it's a, this is a huge win for Aaron Bummer. Huge. Because he just doesn't serve a purpose for the White Sox. He does no. not, not for this team. And to bring in potentially three plus starters, mm -hmm. three plus potentially, I'm not going to jump. Nah, let's go one and a half. I don't give a, I, if we're going to talk I, about it. Yeah. Let's be one. It's it's it, it's it's basically it's it's a no risk high reward for the White Sox. Yeah, no risk high reward. Uh, we're gonna hear from Chris in a second, uh, and we're gonna break down this whole trade. Yeah, a couple of ways to look at this: the White Sox traded away someone who pitches one inning every few days for two potential starters, two solid defensive-minded utility men, three of them former first-round picks, including the Braves. Yeah. Top prospect entering last season. Jared Schuster was the Braves' top prospect last season. The other way to look at it is both teams get what they want and both teams give up what they didn't want. I kind of like looking at it that way. Let's yeah. hear from let's hear from Chris. This was your question to Chris Getz about how this deal went down. Roll tape. Right when uh, you know the World Series ended. You know, certainly in anticipation for the GM meetings, a lot of conversations begin and, and you learn uh, what other clubs needs are, what your own needs are. Um, you, you you get an understanding of of how they value some of your players um, and interest levels. And, you know, obviously you, you've, you've got your data points there and then you just kind of continue the conversation. Sometimes what drives it is the the urgency from the other end or perhaps it's your own urgency. I just felt, you know, when when, you know, here recently this past past couple of days when things really began to uh, um, heat up between, you know, uh, the Braves and myself and Alex Anthopoulos, who who um, is definitely a high pace uh, general manager, and and I enjoyed a lot of the conversations and breaking down different players and and certainly talking about Aaron and, and the players that we acquired, uh, came to the point where he put something on the table that I felt like. Um, was a step forward in where we needed to go. Um, and once again, acquiring some starting pitching uh, innings there and also improving our defense. And it now allows us to, to um, open, some, open some things up, uh, so to speak, when it comes to acquiring free agents or future deals. Um, you know, so much of this is at the mercy of other clubs and how the, the urgency of, of some of these free agents and, and when they want to sign. So I think this is a foundational move for us um, and, uh, you know, look forward to, to adding what we just acquired. All right. So Guff, what do you think about what Chris said there to your question? Yeah. I mean, like for the, the, the way I look at it is I, I thought 
And that's why I said on the podcast, that's why I wanted to know. That's why I asked him the question. I thought the White Sox would make a move prior to, remember we talked about, will the White Sox make a move yeah. prior to the winter meetings? And I thought the answer was yes. I was thinking more of like an alloy, but this is perfect because now your entire deck is completely reshuffled based upon need. And they still need more depth in the pitching rotation. They might need a starter at, at shortstop, but they have a better understanding of how a their 40 man shakes that which is now at 40 that doesn't really matter in the long term they can make move guys around but it certainly sets them up for knowing when to act and when to pounce on if there's a free agent for the rotation or somewhere else that they need to act on at the winter meetings versus wait to see what other teams do i think this puts the white Sox in a really strong position as in the next heading into the next three weeks and chris basically you know, he basically validated that. And what I thought was interesting about that answer, it's very clear that Alex Anthopoulos is a an aggressive GM yeah. who's probably um, a little antsy, it seemed like, right? You win 106 games-ish. I don't know what they won, but – and then get beat in the playoffs. And it's like, wait, how do we have – how do we have, you know, two guys in the top four of MVP and fall flat on our face? Well – I'm not going to wait around for the reliever market to dictate what I do. I'm going to go out and get what I think is one of the best left-handers available. And these are guys we don't know what to do with. And our 40-man decision, This is, we need to get rid of some of these guys anyway. Yeah. I don't care if I have to give up two more in order to get that one guy I want. And so it's great because for Getz, it's, a, um, you know, it's, his, it's his first real trade, right? His first oh, real uh, – Yeah. Yeah, yeah first, first real trade. And I like that how he kind of went in depth about his experience at the GM meetings, kind of feeling it out, figuring out personality traits, and understanding if a guy like Anthopoulos calls, he might be a little antsier than some others. It might be time to get the deal done. All right. So why did the Braves make this trade? In their press release announcing the trade, they yeah had Bummer's record five and five, his ERA of six point seven nine, and they added. I've never really seen this. I don't think in a press release never. his barrel percentage, his never. barrel percentage of two point seven percent, which ranked in the ninety ninth percentile of pitchers last season. They included his ground ball rate, which was in the ninety seventh percentile. Bummer's making five point five million next season, then club options for twenty twenty five and twenty twenty six at seven million dollars. So. They're in win now mode. The yep. White Sox are in. We need guys mode. We need to fill holes mode. So let's go into who the White Sox are getting. Well, first off, you don't have to watch Aaron Bummer in a White Sox uniform anymore. That's and the biggest win. That's the biggest win. <laughs> I love it. He's a good dude, but I just, I'm done. It no, I know. I know. I know. I know. Um, so Mike Soroka. Uh, not to be confused with former White Sox pitcher Mike Soraka, who pitched for the White Sox during Chuck Garfine's lost years when he was not following the White Sox. Come to I'm me about, about my information. That's talking about me in the third person for a second time. Um, so Getz said that Soroka and Schuster could compete or will compete for starting rotation spots next season. Getz added, we're going to require more starting pitching. and. One thing that Chris said on NLB Network yesterday, which was really revealing to me as Ryan is eating lunch while we're talking here, you're you're, 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 you can multitask. I'm, I love you call me Ryan. You even call me Ryan. I don't know I'm calling you Ryan. I'm calling you Ryan. I'm referring to myself as Chuck Garfine. I am an, I'm three, all out of sorts three, today. Three times in this podcast, you referred to me Ryan, which you haven't done three times in 20 years. But Listen, if you trade Aaron Bummer for five players, you are going to get – Chuck Garfine, all out of sorts. I like it. I'm a fan of, I hope this is the first of many Chuck Garfine out of sorts this winter. Okay. So Chris said on LV Network that he's prioritizing defense. Listen to what he said here. As we're talking to free agents, I want them to know that they're going to have a sound defense for them to come out here and perform. Dude, that's such a different message. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be amazing, but... This is a, a new voice in the front office that says, like, you know, for us to get these starting pitchers, I need to change the reputation amongst pitchers in Major League Baseball that don't want to come here because why would you come here and have a crappy ERA and lose games because you have a bad defense behind you? 
Well, of course you have to change the narrative. They haven't had a top 15 defense. They've had, I think they've had a top 15 defense once in the last 11 years. They've been in the bottom 20 the last 10. So that that's not even a narrative. It's fact. It's yeah. just like you print it out and look at the bottom, and the White Sox are routinely at the bottom of the of the majors in defense. So was uh, you know Tony used to say buzzards luck for Aaron Bummer, and he, I, I don't disagree. The the numbers show it. It's just this is all about fit, and that's why I say regardless of how this works out, like I think multiple multiple players from this group will will come up. Some might succeed, some might have little flashes, and some might fall on their face. It's a huge win for the White Sox. Okay. Remind me at the end of the podcast, because I want to ask you the question after we go through everybody, is this a blockbuster trade or not? Okay. okay. Save yep. your thoughts. Okay. I, I, have a, I have a comp that I will save for. Okay. Let's start with Nicky Lopez. He's a guy that, I mean... Well, him and Soroka are, are the big names that people know about. But Nicky Lopez is great defensively. Phenomenal. He was plus four last season at second base. He can play shortstop. He can play third, Yoan Mankata. Oh, did I just say that? Um, Keep saying and, <laughs> and he can run the bases. Uh, the Braves acquired him at the deadline. He had some playoff experience, not a ton, but he was you know in the clubhouse with those guys. He's from Naperville Central. And yes, He's a former Kansas City Royal. There's a lot going on there. And he's bats left-handed. Uh, you know, one of many reasons I'm, I'm sad that Jason Benetti won't be back, but the amount of Nicky Lopez local guy references, um, I hope that continues regardless of who's in the booth because every time he steps in, the batter's backs are all, all on the field against the White Sox. We know exactly where he's from. I can only imagine now that he's in the lineup for the White Sox how many times we're going to hear that, but – Look, I, I, here, I can give a shit about, like, a lot of people on my Twitter feed were like, hey, it wouldn't be a trade without a former Royal. Um, here's what I'll say about a former Royal. If a World Series contender is acquiring him at the deadline, that I look at him as an asset. That's yeah. what I look at. I, I look at that more than I look at Nicky Lopez's career Kansas City Royal. So if the Atlanta Braves are acquiring him to make their team better at the deadline, I'm all for it. The guy played in a postseason game this season against the Phillies. He made multiple appearances, but this is one of those guys. Like we talked about adding guys He's like a good piece to your team. We Real talked about piece. they need four, five, six Nicky Lopez types. Guys that are gonna preach a different message that are gonna say, Hey, we we didn't do this in it. We're not doing this here. Like Nicky Lopez, not a star but a guy who's been in the league and knows how to stay in the league with what he does well, if he can bring that to the table, then, and, and instill it in spring to some of the guys on the roster and some of the guys that are going to be on the roster in the coming year, Colton Montgomery, et cetera, et cetera. Colson. Colson, Jesus, did I say Colton? Yeah, for the like, second podcast in a row. I didn't say Colton Montgomery last time. Yeah, you, you did. I had to correct you. Brian bullshit. <laughs> can't wait to get We're all out of sorts. Aaron Bummer traded. I, mean, I can't wait to get hammered for that one. Anyway, um, yeah, so Nicky, listen, he's not, there is a chance he's the starting second baseman. There's a chance, but I think if it's a real win of a trade with him, just him specifically, yeah. is that he's your utility guy coming off the bench. Give me that. That's I two, like that. Two, two so. to three starts a week. Yeah. All right. So Soroka, 2019, he's a rookie. He was second in the National League in Rookie of the Year voting. Sixth for Cy Young Award, 13-4, and 2.6 AD rate, made the All-Star team. He was very, very popular in Atlanta. And he was out of minor league options and might have been non-tendered on Friday. So the Sox, you know, took advantage of the situation. So did the Braves. So this is where, like, you know, don't just look at all these players and be like, what the Braves just gave up all these guys. Well, they might've been just non trending him anyway. And, and he's a free agent at the end of this season. So like the Sox are getting him for one year, maybe they're flipping him at the deadline. But what did you think about just adding him to this rotation? He's got a big injury history, which we can talk about as well. I think he's the most exciting and intriguing piece to be honest with you, just because, you know, and you heard, Chris made reference to Jake Berger. 
Yeah. About an Achilles injury. Look, you have a motivated guy, Chuck, who's in a prove it situation. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. This is the kind of stuff that I'm talking. This is this is to me, this lines up for and a track record of success and groomed in Atlanta. Like, check, check, check. Mm -hmm. Injury history. He fits in well here because we have plenty of that. Um I just like the idea of a motivated player. What if he gives you 10 starts and like goes to the IL, but they're 10 good starts? That's two months. This yeah. is it. This is like this is the ultimate low risk all reward, not even like high reward. It's I look at a motivated player that understands that there's money at the end of the tunnel and hasn't been healthy for two plus seasons. And this gives them an opportunity, clean slate, no Atlanta pressure has to be a guy has to fall back into that rookie of the year conversation has mm -hmm. to be a one or a two on a team trying to win the world series, throw all that out the window and get back to who you are as a pitcher. I, this is the, to me, and I know it's likely that he could only be here for one year. To me, it's the most intriguing name in the trade. Yeah. So here's what happened to him. And yeah, this is going to sound familiar to all of you. He tore his Achilles in 2020. Yep. Had a setback and needed a second Achilles surgery. June of 2022, walks back to the clubhouse, tears his Achilles again. Okay. Horrible. He missed all of 2021. Pitched only 25 innings in the minors in 2022. This past season, he started in AAA, 87 innings, had a 3.62 ERA, called up, pitched 32 innings with the Braves, got his first win on June 30th, first major league win in over 1,000 days. This is like this Jake Berger thing all over again. On July the 6th, he pitches three innings out of the bullpen for the Braves against the White Sox, yep. against Jake Berger. Yep. He gave up a two-run homer to Luis Robert but also got Berger on a ground out. And after Soroka tore his Achilles for a second time, who reached out to say to Soroka, hey, anything you need, I'm here for you, Jake Berger. Jake That'd be Berger a lot better story if Jake Berger was still in the White Sox. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so they talked on the phone once a month for about two years, Jake Berger and Mike Soroka. And I want to share with you, like, who are the White Sox getting in Soroka? I can't wait to talk to him, by the way. Yeah. This is from The Athletic. Quote, uh, one of the writers wrote this. The Braves stress the importance of the mental makeup of players. And Soroka is figuratively off the charts in terms of character and all the characteristics they look for in a competitor and a teammate. It's a big reason they continue to give him contracts while he's rehabbed for nearly three years. This is Jake Berger 2.0. On the mound. Yeah. And the difference between Berger and Soroka, is it Soroka? Is that how you say it? Yeah. I think Soroka. I, I've always I heard called Soroka. Oh, it's Soroka. I've, yeah, it's, uh, I've always called him Soroka because I just like the... Yeah, the, I know. Um, the big difference between uh, the two is that Soroka, Soroka has had success. You know, Berger had not really done anything in the majors and had these injuries. But you wonder, and we can find this out, you wonder if they kind of both kept each other in the game, you know? And again, everything you just read right there validates how I feel about this trade. Because if he's the only thing that comes out of this trade is a motivated Soroka and you get one great, like you get, let's say you get a Clevenger type season out of him. What a trade. Like yeah. what, a, what a trade. And whether Dylan Cease is here or not, what he can bring as a younger veteran to a rotation that again groomed in Atlanta, like that goes back three, four decades, and it's still happening. Spencer Strider, Max Freed, they're developing three or four guys. decades, huh? Three or four Devel decades developing pitchers in Atlanta, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, 80s, you're right. I know a couple, I, I yeah. know we're, we're old, Chuck. What I'm telling you is, we're old, <laughs> yes. And, um, <laughs> But he come. I, I just like this. This goes back to bringing in. This goes back to bringing in leadership positions from other organizations, and you're getting now motivated players to fit the 2024 White Sox that have had success from organizations that, quite frankly, you would sell, like drool all over yourself to be like. 
you'd drool to be the Atlanta. We would drool to be the Atlanta Braves. Yes. You know, I'd love to be talking about an early exit in the playoffs. That shouldn't have happened. And I, I again, I, I, I'm going to die on this hill. Like I don't, if, if he makes three starts for the White Sox and it doesn't work out, I still think the intrigue is there. All right. So then there's Jared Schuster and, I was stunned to see this. I, he's first round pick out of Wake Forest, 25 year old lefty. The White Sox need lefties. Entering the start of this past season, who was the number one prospect um, for the Braves? Jared Schuster he was the top prospect, but then he didn't have a good year. He got surpassed by a lot of younger prospects and, and uh, or other, I say other prospects and pitchers in the brave system he was inconsistent i looked at his numbers i mean 30 strikeouts 26 walks and 52 winnings he had a 5.81 era in the majors but he had games against the mariners where he gave up one hit over six innings seven k's he had a game where he beat the nationals gives up three runs over five no walks no strikeouts um you know with a new pitching coach and now and brian bannister there is potential there with him i'm curious to see what he can do Here's my comp with Jared Schuster. All right, let's hear it. Then he doesn't have the ceiling, I don't think, that this guy did as the number one overall pitching prospect in baseball. But it's all about timing. What were the Atlanta Braves trying to do last year? Win a World Series. Win a World Series. How much patience did they have for Jared Schuster? None. They gave him probably more than they thought, but he was up, he was down, he was back up again, he was back down again. It reminds me of a guy named Lucas Giolito in Washington mm. when they were running out of patience and he was in double A, triple A, up to the majors, back to double A, back to the majors, back to triple A because they were trying to win. That's what Jared Schuster reminds me of. Maybe not quite the talent and the talk about. I think at one point Giolito was the number one pitching prospect in baseball. I'm not sure Jared Schuster is that, but to be the top prospect in the or in any organization tells you that this guy's highly thought of and has talent. But it, it, how the stars align in baseball, you have that much window that your window of your margin for error sometimes when you come up is that big. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, it's not that big in Chicago. If he pitches well and they can get his head on straight and has a good spring training, or even if they say, hey, man, here's what we're looking put five starts together down in Charlotte and you're going to come up in mid May. Like if they have a plan for him and tell him, we just want you to pitch. We want you to throw, get rid of this pitch, throw these three pitches, and just make your start every fifth day, and the reward will be the big leagues. He can be a guy that comes up at the back end of your rotation in 2024 and has a five ERA, and you're going, dude, you take the ball every fifth day, you eat four and two-thirds to five and two-thirds innings, and you're exactly who we need you to be, keep being that guy. And that's like that's where I'm at with Schuster. I, I think, like again, you come up in Atlanta – you give up, you pitch three innings on September 16th. Now, granted, they had a huge lead. You give up five earned runs, seven hits, two bombs. It's kind of like, dude, I mean, we just we can't live with this as we get ready to yeah. play in October. Go back the, to Gwinnett. And the White Sox can live with that. Yeah, he's um I was looking at some articles from spring training last season. And there was all sorts of buzz about him. Like he's going to be the number five guy in this rotation that's going to win the World Series. It was all him, 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 him. And then, you know, ends up being shuffled up and down. I, I like that comp. That's really interesting. There's more to the story because you and I, okay, yeah, we're not digging in on Jared Schuster during the season. We're just looking at his stats and going, what the F happened to this guy? Yep. <laughs> so interesting. All you right. Know, Brayden, you know, oh, go ahead. Going. No, keep going. I, I think uh, they keep going. Let's stop at the other guys. All right, Braden uh, Shoemake. So he is he okay? He was he was the Braves' fifteenth best prospect when this trade was made, and MLB Pipeline already updated their White Sox prospect rankings. Want to guess where Shoemake is? He was fifteenth with the Braves. Where is he with the White Sox? Six. Ladies and gentlemen. 27th. Holy shit. <laughs> White Sox system is 27th. Unless I was looking at his jersey number. No, he is literally 27th on the White Sox prospect list. And what happened was, and I have not looked really into the Braves 
farm system. But if you look at the Braves farm system in 2022, like all those guys just got sent to the majors. And now there's a gap, massive gap. But that's it's, how it's supposed to be, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm just saying like, that's how that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. he was a first round pick in 2019. And from what I've read, he is like last season was one of the best defensive shortstops in the minor leagues in Shoemake. Okay. Yeah. Stole 27 bases in AAA, was caught once. He's going to be 26. He's a left handed bat. What is holding him back is his hitting. His development seemed to stall as a hitter last season in AAA at a 706 OPS. He's six foot three, big dude. So, um, you know, what is Chris Getz talking about? Defense, defense, defense. Let's get some defense. That's going to help us get some pitching. And then, oh, by the way, we need some offense. And that's a whole other story. So let me ask you a question. I'm going to give you, like, if I'm telling you this blind on the podcast, yeah, and yeah. for those of you listening, here's what I'm going to tell I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you the guy's name, but here's what he did last year. He was the best defensive shortstop or top three defensive shortstop in the entire minor leagues. A. He had 28 doubles, three triples, and 16 homers. Drove in, drove in 69 and had 27 stolen bases. What are you saying? And he's now, and now you have him. I'm saying, can he do that in the majors? Well, I'm giving you the opportunity to, because you don't have a guy right now on your roster that can do that at that position. If he only plays great defense, and let's say he goes from 28 doubles to 18 doubles to one triple to 10 homers to 40 RBI, and he goes to 20 stolen bases, and he plays impeccable defense. Yeah. Again, this is about patience. The Atlanta Braves were the 27 Yankees last year. I mean, I'm not kidding. Yeah. Their only comp to the Atlanta Braves offense was the 27 Yankees. Their worst hitter in their lineup, their second baseman, had 17 homers. They don't have time for this. Yeah, They don't have time to wait. They need to win now. He's 25. I'm not trying to tell you that the White Sox just stole something. They took a 15th rated prospect. And now he's buried on their own. But the intrigue here for a team that is trying to bridge the gap, I keep calling 2024 a bridge year. Some, like, baseball's a weird sport, man, where these guys put a ton of pressure on themselves because they know the Atlanta Braves. They know the history. They know what they're trying to succeed in or trying to accomplish. And it's like, hey, we're calling you up. You get four at bats. He played two games in the majors. He gets four at bats, played appearances, 0 for 4, boom, gone, yeah. back down. I'm just, and then, and they said that he regressed as a hitter. Well, he came up in May, Chuck. So now he came up early May. He goes down. He's like, shit, maybe I can't do it. He, oh, he, oh, I mean, the window is like this. Look at the guys who are playing second base and shortstop. I got no chance. You put all this pressure on yourself. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I, I, I'm just, I, I, that's why this is a great trade because of who you traded. You didn't trade one of your former number one. Like you didn't trade Luis Robert and we're sitting here trying to build you up on 25 year olds. Yeah. I just think you're, you're trying to thread the needle a little bit and you're trying to like, you're trying to pounce on some guys that another organization doesn't have time for right now. Right. It's very similar to a lot of the trades the White Sox made at the deadline. Like, yeah, you're giving up guys, but guys you don't really need anymore because their contracts are all running out. So whoever you get back is like gravy. Well, White Sox have no purpose for Aaron Bummer on their team. So let's bring in some guys who can fill some roles and maybe, just maybe, one, two, three, four of these guys turn into something for your team. So um, like the possibilities for him. And finally, we got Riley Goins from Libertyville. He went to U of I, drafted in the ninth round this past year from the Braves. At a combined 1.15 ERA in five games in rookie ball in low A, uh, 22 strikeouts, six walks, and 15 and two thirds. I mean, it's, you know, we'll see. We'll see what he turns out to be. Watch, he'll be the best player in the deal. I mean, he's one of those, but isn't he like, because he's an older, he went to college, he's an older reliever. I mean, he's a, is he a starter? He's a starter, I think. Uh, I don't know. Let me look. He had two star. He's kind of a, he's, he, you know what? He's going to be a reliever. I'm already looking at him. He's gonna be a reliever. He's he's had some starts, but he's he's already, like in 2023 he had five games, three starts. You know, he had kind of both. But he, you know, flyer, flyer, flyer. Yeah, stash and store. 
All right. So, and then we got to get to this Eloy stuff. But before we do, is this, could we call this an Aaron Bummer blockbuster trade? Yes. Oh, yes. It's a blockbuster. It's a blockbuster that could literally lead to no players panning out because of that dude that's a haul how many you very rarely see five for ones yes rare like, to get one for a reliever that has control and that has like you have a couple of guys that are like man like this like i don't know there's a flyer here and three guys that have been like that have been in the majors it's rare man you're not getting like i three thought first rounders uh, three first rare. rounders and, and from the Braves, I think that matters. Yeah. If it doesn't matter to everybody, I know people are kind of like, we're in prove it mode. Like as fans, people are also like, they don't want to hear about time, you know? And, and quite frankly, I don't blame you. But for this particular trade, I just think it's interesting. And so for Aaron Bummer, I, I was so surprised. Like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, I had to like double check that it wasn't a parody account either. So yeah, like I think this could be construed as a blockbuster. And it pseudo reminds me, Again, this is a, a poor man's version of what I think the Adam Eaton trade was. It was a team that was in win-now mode that made no sense on giving up Giolito, Lopez, and Dane Dunning. It literally made no sense until it did because the Washington Nationals won the World Series, and Adam Eaton was a swing away from being the MVP of the World Series, and they won. And whatever happened to Giolito, Lopez, and Dunning, that's what they were willing to pay. And so – it's this is a poor man's version of that, in my opinion. Like there could be some reward that you're getting out of out of it that you couldn't have believed before we started doing this podcast. I would say this: there are different levels of blockbusters. There are the blockbusters that have just big name after big name after big name. There's three teams involved. There's a lot of players. There's 12 teams involved. When you have one for five, and the one is Aaron Bummer. Blockbuster. It's a blockbuster. Now, these five players might be nothing. But then again, almost, you know, many trades amount to a lot of these kind of, oh, they got a little bit of here, a little bit there, not what we expected. But when you, I guess, you know what? You can call it a blockbuster just because of this. If your reaction, your instant reaction to the trade was, wow, blockbuster. <laughs> Whether you knew anything about those guys or not, one for five, Aaron Bummer, we are blockbusting. So that's what I would say to that. All right, finally, before we go, on his call with reporters, Bruce Levine said to Chris Getz, uh, there's a groundswell of interest in Aloy Jimenez. So that is what he is reporting. So he asked Chris Getz about the groundswell of interest in Aloy Jimenez. And Chris said, Quote, teams are interested. It just has to make sense for both sides. Like he is, yeah, that's what Ryan McGuffey right now is saying goodbye to Aloy Jimenez. I think that's, I mean, I think that's the GM question. comes out and says, yeah, it's got to make sense for both sides. Like, yeah, Aloy Jimenez is on the trade block, period. I mean, and it might be why, I mean, Chris also said that they went down and recently had a visit with him in the Dominican just to like have a face-to-face -face visit, see how he's doing. He's extremely, he said, he looks great. He looks motivated. It's up to him to stay that way. I was like, uh-huh. Like, yep, heard that. But maybe that was a visit like, love you, hugging you. This has been great. It just hasn't been what we thought. And we're on. And you know, this might be coming next. Yeah. And that's one of those amicable like conversations. And I don't know. To me, it feels like he's, this is like, starting of like where you put your house on the market you know you put the the for sale sign just went in the yard and it feels official yeah and, and the people are like having an open house there's an open house this weekend for Oloy jimenez <laughs> yeah did they have to stage the furniture or is it the uh, regular furniture oh no there's some staging going on because he's not it, it doesn't always look as good as as you know that room that you thought staged well when you go in to move in and you see that huge scratch underneath where the couch was you're like i didn't know that was there <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they might have done a little bit of fixing up in the house right a little bit of that but look bit. at the swimming pool right and yeah did you see the jacuzzi and the 
pool table and uh, yeah. the, the big movie screen in the basement. Look at all the intangibles. This house has everything except good bones. <laughs> yeah, don't bring the inspector. <laughs> or maybe you should bring the inspector. Oh, this is, oh wait, this is, is this an as is trade? <laughs> This is as is. This is as is. Sign on the dotted line. You've got one hour. Yeah. One hour to all sign loans, on the dotted line or else I'm accepted. going to this other buyer. All loans accepted. <laughs> Cash deal. This is not my favorite. This has become my favorite trade. The favorite trade that hasn't happened yet. All right. We shall see. It. All right. Um, all right. So there it is. The Aaron Bummer trade. The Blockbuster trade. We'll see what is coming next. Uh, the interesting offseason that we uh, expected and, and, in essence, promised. Or you could say that Chris Getz promised it because, you know, he's basically saying to everyone, I'm open for business. Uh, it has begun. It has materialized. And we'll see what happens next. Good stuff, Guff. Outstanding. Let's get, hey, all things must go. Yes. We're having, estate, we're having an estate sale. <laughs> Not a garage sale. Estate no, sale. Estate. Or maybe it is a garage sale. This is an estate sale. Estate. <laughs> All right. That is a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox checking with free ATMs nationwide. Go to their special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash Sox. Hawk Harrelson, take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over.